Praise the Lord. Amen all the time. Amen. Listen, I don't care how far down you are. You praise the Lord. Ryan, why don't you bring that over here? Can you do that? <clears throat> there you go. Ryan's, we're going to show off Ryan's artwork. This is Ryan's artwork. I said, draw your best representation of your dad. <laughs> so for some reason, he drew his sister. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Amen. Mary Hart doeth good like a medicine. Amen. Amen. It's good to laugh. It really is. When you, I don't know about you, but and you know how vain we are, okay? And everybody's like this somehow, some way. Uh, when I'm down, I don't, I don't like to watch dramas on TV because I'm going. That's so sad, okay? So I, I want a little humor, okay? Kind of help it. It does help out a lot. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Um, Psalm 139. Psalm 139. This is, it's, it's going to be like the next sermon. Uh, in, I was, a while back I was preaching out of Psalm 139. About the body. The membership. Christ's body. And... Um, so anyway, I thought I was done. And um, I, as I said before, I went to the office last night. And I just said, God, I need a message. And uh, God just kind of helped me out. Um, the, for the first time in my ministerial history, today is the day I'm going to preach the whole Bible today. Okay? The whole Bible. Hope you had breakfast. <laughs> Did you have breakfast, Bradley? Not much. Man, you're eating less now that you're married than you did before. <laughs> That's good for you. You're going to end up like me one of these days. Amen. Um, Psalm 139. My eyes fell upon verse 17 first. <clears throat> and God had my eyes fall on this verse for a reason. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. And when I awake, I am still with thee. Can I have somebody say amen? But I want to look at verse 14, 15, <clears throat> and 16. I will praise thee. By the way, I want to ask this morning, is, is this the word of God? Amen. You believe it? Amen. Okay, amen. Got some folks here from Tennessee. He's nodding his head. So I'm glad to hear in Tennessee they still believe the Bible. Amen. 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 You welcome them here this morning, all right? Uh, this is the Word of God, and its words are right and true, and they are life and they are seed. And um, you don't need to apply God's Word. It'll just do what seed is supposed to do. Amen? You ever notice that even when you pave it like a parking lot out here, in the worst of all possible conditions with oil and everything all over it, seed finds a way? Amen. And it aggravates us to no end, doesn't it, Sterling? Because seed on a parking lot, that ain't good. Okay? 
We want our parking lot to look nice and black with yellow stripes on it. Okay? We don't need cracks and weeds growing out of it to make it look pretty. Amen? It's just something to think about that nature and man's work don't usually mix too well together. It's best to just let nature be nature. Amen? God does a pretty good job on his own. Somebody say amen. I hope they never put a high-rise building at the Grand Canyon. Amen. If you've ever been there, you've, if you've seen, have you ever seen pictures of the Grand Canyon? You have not seen the Grand Canyon. Okay? If you've seen it with your eyes, then you have seen the Grand Canyon. I hope they never build a high-rise there to mess it all up. Anyway, uh, the Word of God. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. See, down deep inside, I know that God's working is marvelous. I know it. Down deep in my heart, I know it very well. Verse 15, my substance was not hid from thee. When I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Now verse 16. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. How many of you were born that way? Say amen. amen. We're all born unperfect. Some to greater degrees than others. But eventually, that imperfection takes its toll on everybody. I can see the imperfection in my own body taking its toll. I sat around yesterday, of course I was tired, but I sat around yesterday with a jacket on and Caleb's little camouflage snuggie. Don't make fun of me. Listen, the older you get, the more your bones will ache and you'll just be looking for anything to cover up. That's why some older people like dogs. They just have the dogs come and warm them up. Amen? You laugh all you want to, you young fellas. Amen, Roy? Amen. Amen. Um, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. So all of us are that way. But there is a perfection coming. Amen. Okay? And in thy book... All my members were written. We talked about that. That's your DNA. And that's the Bible. Okay? Now, which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. Now, I don't know how many sermons I preached on this. I might have been four or five or something like that. And done videos on it. And it just pops up in teaching. It's an absolutely man magnificent place to ponder in the Bible. And uh, I always talked about how, you know, in that book all that members were written and that's our, that's our DNA, that is the, the Bible, the Word of God. And I talked about when as yet there was none of them and how this Bible is a book of prophecy and this and that and the other. But I, always, I never really focused much on which in continuance were fashioned. I never really focused on that until God led me to focus on it last night. And I just started pondering this issue of... How the book is written and how our members are, can, how our life is fashioned by Almighty God. You're less responsible for how you are right now than you think you are. God ultimately is responsible. God is the creator. He's the author of the book. That means the author determines how it begins and the author determines... How it ends. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. Isn't that what we believe? Say amen. amen. We believe that God is the one who writes this stuff. Man doesn't, man's trying to. And I can tell you that with all the genetic research that's going on right now, mankind is on the verge of destroying himself. God won't have to destroy, man's going to do it himself. How many of you believe that? Say amen. Um, and if you want to know what the end result of all this DNA stuff is, go to the book of Revelation and read about the seven vials of wrath that are poured out. You'll see the end result. I promise you that's, that's where it's headed. But anyway, in, my, in thy book all my members were written which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. And I'm just going gonna, gonna to preach you the whole Bible this morning. God helped me last night. So I had Ryan draw a stick figure of a human being. Up on the board. And I, I can't make fun of Ryan. That's about my artistic ability right there when it comes to drawing and, and graphing and things like that. 
Uh, I want you to take your Bible now to Revelation 13. Revelation 13. <clears throat> You pray for me while I preach this morning. Can you do that? I need some guys holding one arm up and holding the other arm up. Revelation 13. <clears throat> you get there, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, Lord, I need your help today. Lord, I, I didn't get a whole lot of time, to, Lord, to just plan this sermon out and figure it out and plot it all out and write down a bunch of verses and Lord I, to be honest Lord I was just too tired to and I'm about too tired to preach it but uh, Lord I, I just I wouldn't have it any other way this is in my heart and I thank you for it and uh, Lord I just uh, Lord I just promised you Lord that if you if you'd give it to me I'd give it out <clears throat> and uh, so, Lord, I'm asking for your help, and, and I pray, Lord, that this would be a blessing to somebody else other than me. It's already been a blessing to me. And uh, so I'm asking, God, that you would use this sermon, this message, to be a blessing to somebody. Lord, if there's somebody here that's lost, they're going to go to hell. Lord, they're going to burn in hell forever. And I pray, dear God, Lord, it doesn't have to be that way. Lord, you died to save the sinner. And I, Lord, there's times when I feel like I am the chief of all sinners. But you died for me, and yet you live for me. And Lord, Father, show that to somebody this morning. Show it to somebody. That somebody would just come to the point in their life where they'd say, you know what? Christ died for me and now he lives for me and I'm going to die for him and I'm going to live for him. So Lord, you just do uh, what is in your, your will. And I trust you, God. I've always tr trusted you, Lord, throughout all this. And I'm glad, Lord, that I can. You're the only thing that I can trust. And blessed be the Lord this morning. Blessed be his word above all things. Lord, Father, bless your people today. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. Amen. Revelation 13 to 8. What you say, what does Revelation 13 have? Revelation 13 is about the beast. Okay? <clears throat> Let, and I don't... Can I, I'm, just gonna, I'm just gonna talk this morning. Just kind of try to give it out as God's given it to me this morning. Everybody in this room knows who that beast is. Everybody in this room knows who that beast is. You know why you're so familiar with him? Because right now he, he's dwelling inside of you. You say, I don't know if I believe that. Let me tell you what Paul said in Romans 7. Paul said, in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Paul, Paul was aware of it. He knew that he had a sinful, wicked, beast nature dwelling within him. And how many of you know the beast living inside of you right now? How many of you know that one? Say amen. You know your wicked, sinful, rotten, filthy, no good thing that is inside of you right now. You've got it. Okay? And it shouldn't, it shouldn't be any wonder to... If you look at Revelation 13 verse 7, that verse does not stun me like it did the first time I really read it. I mean, I, I've read it for years, but I mean, there was just one day I hit it and I went, that just gets me. That verse doesn't overwhelm me anymore and I get it. Verse 7 of Revelation 13 says, it was, it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And you cannot sit here with your self-righteous attitude and tell me that since you've been saved, it's been la-la land every day and you haven't sinned and you've never been overcome. Because you have. So let's just get off our high horse. Amen? Come down to reality. Come down where we live. So how many of you know who this beast is? Okay? And at, at some point... There's going to star fall from heaven. It's got a key in his hand. It's going to unlock it. It's going to let him go. Now, I'll be honest with you. I don't want him let go in my life. I can tell you that. You don't, listen, you don't either. You don't want him let go in my life. You don't want him let go in your life. It's best that he just stays under lock and key. How about somebody say amen to that? Okay? There are just millions and millions of practical examples when you study prophecy and study the Bible the way it's written and don't try to doubt it. Don't try to retranslate it. We don't need some, some new thing. Amen. We just need the old time way. 
So it was given him unto make war with the saints and overcome them. Power was given him over all kindreds and tongue and nations. Now look at verse 8. All that, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in what? The book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. How many of you know that? That God had determined even before he, he created the heavens and the earth, God had determined that the Lamb was going to be slain. But that, that just amazes me. That God's foreknowledge knew all things that are. And I've been pondering that this weekend. God knew this. God knew this and God had prepared for it. Is what God had done. And any, I, listen, I don't care how, how stupid you've become. And how many stupid things you've done. You cannot overcome God with your stupidity. Sin does not overcome grace. Amen. Grace overcomes sin. And so just think about that. But I want you to notice that we have a book. Now in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance and fashion when as yet there was none of them. And the Bible mentions a book in, in verse 8. This is not first place is mentioned. But it mentions it here. Uh, that all they that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb. Now let me tell you this. If your name is not written in the book of life, it is written in a book. It's the book of death. Did you know that the Egyptian religion was based upon a book called the book of the dead? That's why you ought not follow Egypt in Egyptian ways. Amen? It's a book of the dead. But there is a book of life. And that's what DNA is. That's what this Bible is. Right here, right now, it is the book of life. Are you getting, are you getting this so far? And you've heard me say this before, but I'm going to try to make it a reality to you this morning. It's not just like this generic uh, heavenly book that we cannot see and that don't have any part of. It is not only the book of life, it is the book of all life, and it is the book of your life. Now, I don't know if you can handle that or not. But this Bible, and everybody, everybody, heaven here, everybody got the same King James Bible. Say amen. amen. So when I'm reading it, you're reading exactly the same thing. This Bible is the book of your life and your life and your life and yours and yours and yours and yours. It's, and it's the book of mine. This book has my life written in it. That's amazing. Because, you know, we're kind of all different, right? Okay? I mean, if you look, Bradley... Bradley's different than I am, okay? Uh, I'm better looking than he is. To my wife. Okay? Bradley works out and pumps his muscles up and I operate a forklift. <laughs> and yet, it's the book of our lives. Are you with me? This is it, right? This is all the members that have been written out in the book. And it's the book of our life. Uh, let's see, Revelation uh, 20 verse 12. Whew. The book of life. Revelation 20 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. You know what those books are? Every sin you ever committed. God's got a national security administration up in heaven that is monitoring all your cell phone calls, all your emails, all your internet habits, every conversation that you've ever had. Every time your finger moved, God wrote it down. It's monitored, it's recorded. Every sin you've ever committed, both in action and in thought, they're written in a book. You're not going to get away with it. You think you are. But you're not going to get away with it. The only hope that you have. Is that when they open the book. Of everything that you've ever done in your life. When they finally open that book. And you stand in God's courtroom. Is that they see blood. Covering the writing. the blood of Jesus blotting out our transgressions that is so sweet 
And so anyway, uh, what verse did I tell you? Verse 12. And I saw the dead, both small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. You look at verse 15, and whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast where? Into the lake of fire. See, God will blot names. He said, he said these specific words. He'll say he'll blot you out of the book of all living. Okay? I don't want that. Amen. I want to keep living. I want to live here and then I want to live up in heaven. Amen? I used to hear, Mom, you used to have an old eight-track tape. Of some guys saying, I don't know who it was, but there was an old song called, I've got more to go to heaven for than I've had yesterday. So I remember every song I've ever heard, okay? And I remember mom singing them too, all right? Never get that out of my head. Anyway, <laughs> Revelation 21, verse 27. There shall in no wise enter in anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about heaven. I want to go to heaven when I die. In fact, I'd like to go to heaven without dying. Amen? I'm, amen? I'm a little sissy. I've, I've been almost dead once. and I don't, wanna, I don't want that to happen. I, I've asked God, God, don't do that again. Okay, you better translate me. Amen. Okay, Revelation uh, verse 27. There shall no wise enter in anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination. You know, illness and sicknesses and diseases defile. And sin defiles. And abominations or anything that maketh a lie. That means there's no NIV Bibles in heaven. Amen. 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 But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, I'm just, I'm trying to lay it out for you because I'm telling you that this Bible is the book of your life. Okay? And in about, I don't know, about five, ten minutes, God just kind of downloaded this to me last night and said, Mike, here it is. So you stop and think about it. See, what I was doing just think on these things the way the Bible says. I'm just thinking about how the Bible's laid out. And these new goofy scholars now coming out with some new Bibles that have rearranged all the books in the Bible to make it more accurate. Fooey on that nonsense. Amen. Leave this Bible alone. Don't rearrange it. Don't mess it around. Don't change the verses. Don't change the words. Don't move an apostrophe. Don't add a letter. Don't take one away. It's, it's perfect the way it is. And I'm just going to live by it. Now, here's, here's where I'm going with this. Alright? This Bible, right here, is the book of your life. Okay? Now, I want you to think about your life from birth up until now. And where you know you're going. Okay? Every one of us is headed in the same direction that this book is headed in. Every one of us are. Okay? You could say it's from the cradle to the grave and beyond. Okay? From the cradle to the grave and beyond. Let me just run down this very quick. I'm just, I don't know if I'm going to spend a lot of time on this or not. It may not wow you the way it wowed me last night, but it really helped me last night. It was just a blessing to me, and I needed a blessing. Okay? So anyway, we start out with the first book of the Bible. Go turn to the first book of the Bible. Just kind of you get your Bibles out. Okay? And just follow with me here. Alright? The first book of the Bible is called what? Genesis. Did you know that the word Genesis has the word gene in it? Think about that for a while. Genetics. Gene. The word Genesis means the beginning. And so everybody in this room had a beginning. So we have the book of Genesis. I know my writing's lousy this morning. You just bear with me, all right? That's two ends in beginning. Okay? So everybody in this room had a beginning. So Genesis chapter 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You do not, we do not come from monkeys. We do not come from some lava somewhere. We do not fall down from space. God created us to be that way. God said in Genesis chapter 1, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so God, listen to this now, When you were birthed, God made you. Genesis 1 is about the birthing. The whole book of Genesis, is, that, especially at the beginning, is about the birthing. A child is born. And that child is you. Amen? So, so far it fits. So far it fits. So there's the beginning of your life. And it was God who brought you into this world. Not anything else. 
God is the one who brings children into this world. And man doesn't have a right to go inside a mother's womb and stop that process. Listen, that is right out of hell. That's, you know what that is? That's the old dragon standing before the woman waiting to devour her child. And they can't wait till the child's born now. So they go into the woman's womb and cut that child up in pieces before that child is ever born. And that's wicked. And if you vote on somebody that's for that stuff, shame on you. Amen. God is the one who brings life. God is the one who decides that. And so God said, let us make man in our image. So that's your beginning. And then you get into the, the, to the rest of the book of Genesis. You know what you have? The book of Genesis, you have the promises. Genesis chapter 12, God makes a covenant with Abraham. In fact, he's Abram then. He's not even Abraham. He's Abram. God made a promise to you way back at your beginnings. Before you ever lived, before you ever done anything, God gave promises. And here's what will happen. We had this child born, and we look at this thing, and we thank God for it because God is the one who brought it into the world. And then that child is just full of promise. We start working it. You know, you've seen them. Tap on the glass there at the nursery at the hospital. Oh, look at his hands. He's going to be a baseball player. Oh, look at her feet. She's going to be a dancer. Oh, look at this. Oh, look at that. And we've already, in our mind, we've, we've kind of given promises. Uh, oh, I'm da- daddy's going to do this for you. Mama's going to do this for you. Granddaddy's going to spoil you. We're going to give you all of these things. That child hadn't done nothing yet. And yet, laid upon this child are these unconditional promises that are full of love and full of hope that someday God will get glory out of this and someday there will be a blessing come out of this child. Somebody say amen. Amen. Now, let me just throw this in here just very quickly. Right off the bat, we have the birth. But even before the blessings come, watch this now, corruption starts to show up. Not too long after a baby's born, then the corruption... I'm not going to get into all that. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Amen? Okay? Then the corruption shows up, but then the blessings come. All right? Now watch this. Here's the second part. Turn to the book of Exodus. Okay? We have Genesis. We have Exodus. Turn to Exodus chapter 20. What's Exodus chapter 20? What's in there? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Thou shalt not take the Lord God thy God's name in vain. Honor the Sabbath, keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. You know what that is? That's the law. Watch this now. A child is born, and for a long time, that child has no rules. Amen? That child has no rule. That child is just living free and naked. Amen? Had no rules. But at some point, now watch this, at a young age, what happens is the rules start being laid down. And you hear mamas everywhere going, no, no. And children, before they learn Mississippi, they learn, no, no. It's funny to watch Michaela. Okay? She's heard no, no most of her waking hours. And she repeats it. At least she told me, she said, that is funny. Because she'll be doing something she knows is wrong. And she'll see me looking at her and she'll turn around and go, no, no. (laughs) So we're born. Corruption shows up. We're given promises. We're given hope. Amen? We're given hope. Then the law shows up. You know what the book of Galatians says about the law? It's a schoolmaster. Because these kids grow up and then what we do with them? Start teaching them. Start teaching them. Send them to school. Send them to the elementary school. Learn reading, writing, arithmetic. The three R's. And then we're teaching them. We're going to take them to the school of hard knocks. Amen? Oh, no, you can't do this. That's going to be a hard knock. Oh, that's going to hurt. You're going to do that. And so what happens is the child starts learning the law and the law becomes a schoolmaster over them and the law is all about discipline. Amen? I believe you ought to whip your child. Amen? They do something wrong, you ought to whip them for it. Amen? Reprimand them first because God will rebuke us with His words first. And then if we don't change, get the rod and staff out. Amen? I'll get some of you liberals going here in a little bit. All right? Amen? So the laws, that's Exodus through Deuteronomy. 
Watch this now. Joshua. Turn to Joshua. Joshua through Nehemiah. Isn't it amazing that the Bible is, is cut up in all these little different sections? Who did that? The Roman Catholic Church is putting TV spots all over America saying that they're the ones responsible for the, putting the Bible together. I'm not giving them one ounce of credit for that. They can, that that'd be like me saying, oh, I, I put that together like that. You don't believe that? Amen? God is the one who built this thing. And God, you know why? Because it's the book of your life. So you had the beginning, you were born, corruption shows up, you were given promises, and now you're at that age where the law is being spoken to you, and you don't like it. We learn at an early age that we don't like rules and regulations and guidelines and stipulations and fence. We don't like anything like that. We like to rebel, but the law is trying to teach us some things. And then we get into the age of the, of the I, don't, I don't know what I, what did I have on my paper here. This is the time of warfare. It's the constant struggle between right and wrong. And that's what you have through Joshua, through Nehemiah. You study Joshua. And it's all about the warfares. The war, the battle that goes on. At, 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 at some point, a child learns right and wrong. Then we find out that it's a struggle to do what's right. Because we always want to do wrong. When you study Joshua, Judges, Ruth... 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah. You know what you're going to see? You're going to see a constant up and down flipping of Israel going from righteousness to wickedness. Constantly. Constantly going back. And, how many of that? That's your life. Say amen. And you started that way years ago. Your mom and daddy taught you to do what right. And so when you wanted to do what's wrong, you didn't do it in front of your mom and daddy. You went out behind the woodshed. We went off down the woods somewhere. We went over somebody else's house where you knew you, know, you could do some things wrong. Mom and daddy found out about it. They gave you a whipping and you say, you know what? I don't want to do that anymore. And you think you're not going to do it anymore. Then what happens? Right back at it again. And that is these books right here. You study it out. You'll see it. You'll see it. So this is taking a child all... Seven, eight, nine, ten years old, somewhere around in eleven. That's taking that child up to this point here. Okay? Then what do we have after that? We have Job. Everybody turn to the Psalms. Job through... Oh, I like this. I like this. God, you help me today. Job through Song of Solomon. A child, they learn the law, they struggle with it, constant up and down. But then something happens when they get, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 years old. Okay? And I remember this in my life. I, I was one that had, I mean, just a lot of low self-esteem. I tried basketball in ninth grade. I'm tall, but I can't run. Okay? And I can't shoot good. Okay, I practiced some layups because I was tall enough to, and I got halfway decent at layups. But you asked me to go out, Charlie asked me to go out and shoot a three-point shot. Don't ask me to shoot a three-point shot. Charlie, I, he's playing basketball, he's getting pretty good. Charlie's good at it, okay? Can you make them side angle shots down the base? I don't like you. <laughs> They'd give me that ball down, there'd be that net down there, they'd give me that ball down there, and I'd shoot that thing, and wham! I mean, it goes ten feet over on the other side. <laughs> so, sports was not my thing. But what happened was, I found out that I could see. And I played the French horn, which they don't just give to everybody, they give to kids that can hear. And I played the French horn, really, really tight little lip thing here, and then I went to the tuba. Because you can look at me and say, that's a tuba player. <laughs> Amen, Matthew. Matthew's following in daddy's footsteps. He's playing the tuba now. Okay, you know, what, you know what I saw happen in him? All of a sudden, watch this now, this creativity and artisticness started coming out. And he's starting to think deeper thoughts than he used to think when he was seven and eight years old. Or four when he liked the Teletubbies. 
There's not, you don't have to have deep philosophy when you're watching Teletubbies. Amen? Okay? But you start getting up around 12, 13, 14 years old. You listen to this now. And you start thinking deep things. Read the book of Job. The book of Job is all about philosophy. It's deep thoughts. Amen? Psalms are what? Songs. Music. Proverbs. Child starts getting wisdom in them. They learn that some things probably are not the best thing in the world. Are you following me so far? Isn't this cool? The, the, the deep thinking sets in and the, start, the creativity starts coming out. Whether you can shoot a basket or whether you can play a tuba or a flute or whether you can draw. No matter how you can draw. All that stuff. The Bible's in order. It is the book of your life. So the creativity starts coming out and, and you just you have this little renaissance in your life. Okay? What's this book here? Song of Solomon. What's it about? Falling in love. How many of you remember the first time you fell in love? Doesn't have to be with the person you're sitting by now. But along about this time, you start looking at that gal sitting across the classroom. And she's pretty. Or you start looking at that guy, if you're a young lady. You start looking at that guy. And all of a sudden, he's, he's kind of nice looking. And you do what Solomon and Sheba did. You write poems and love songs. And songs on the radio come in and they mean something now. And five years ago, they didn't mean any. Now, the, now you're going, oh. And God put that in the Bible. You see, falling in love with someone. That it doesn't matter what she looks like. You think she's the prettiest thing that God ever said in front of your eyes. Amen? Amen. Doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. And God gave us the gift of falling in love with somebody and wanting to be with them till death do us part. Can I hear you say amen? amen? What comes next in the Bible? Isaiah through Malachi. Those are called the prophets. You know what the prophets foretold? Every one of them foretold the pending judgment that was coming in your life. Every one of them. Because now you got all this going, and all this stuff is coming in and your body has matured. And let's face it, by the time you're 14, 15 years old, you're set to do a lot of sin. Roy, how old were you when you, when you first took, you took your first drink? Ten. Ten? Okay. Who took, who took their first drink when they were about 13, 14 years old? Fifteen, somewhere around in there. Go ahead. Listen, you're not going to jail. <laughs> Listen to me. You get into your teens and your 20s. And here's what God's trying to show you. Remember thy creator in the days of thy youth. Because if you forget him, there's going to be hell to pay. And there's some of you sitting here right now that's in this stage of life right here. And I'm here to tell you, you keep going, there's hell to pay. You, you older folks, say amen, raise your hand. You testify. There is hell to pay for living the way we lived. This Bible's right. Now watch this. I want you to listen to this. Some people never get past this. You've seen these old hippies running around, haven't you? These old guys with long hair like that was when they were 20. 
all with their Harley stuff on, trying to act as tough as they did when they were 20. And still trying to drink as much as they could, and still trying to smoke as much as they could, and still trying to chase women as much as they could, and they're 60 years old, acting like they were 20 again. They never get past this right here. So I read something last night on, on the internet. Somebody posted something. And it said, just think of what it's going to be like 40 years from now. We're going to have a bunch of old people with a lot of tattoos. <laughs> Sorry, Ryan. Let me tell you something. I wouldn't let life stop right here. Because let me tell you, what comes next? This is when Jesus shows up on the scene. Somebody say amen. Jesus is going to show up on the scene. And everything that we've done wrong. And everything that we were warned against. And every wicked thing that we have become in our lives. Christ wants to take it upon himself. And take the condemnation for us. And nail it to his cross. Somebody say amen. He nails it to the cross. And you get down in an altar somewhere. And you say God I'm a fornicator. God I'm an adulterer. God I'm a drinker. I'm a dope head. God I'm a liar and a murderer and a thief. I've done everything wrong. But Lord I was trained not to do this. My mom and daddy taught me better. God I know better. But God I'm a sinner. And Christ comes into our lives. And he changes us. And he saves us. And he makes us a new creation. Somebody say amen. Woo! So I just believe the Bible is the book of your life. So watch this. Here's what happens. Christ shows up on the scene. And now we have the book of Acts. Because when you get saved, you just want to go everywhere teaching and preaching Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You remember when you got excited when you got saved, Gary? Amen. Gary hadn't shut up yet. (laughs) Gary can't want to find a bigger car to put more bumper stickers on. Amen. You want to tell everybody and teach and preach Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what happened to me on the Damascus Road. Amen. Amen. Listen, you're not ashamed of it anymore. Somebody say amen. Amen. Then, we have Romans through Jude. Now you're becoming a disciple. Amen. Now you're learning. You're learning about... Every time you read the New Testament, it makes you think about your old life somehow, some way. How you used to be. How, how it used to be. And God is showing you these... I, listen, I don't get this stuff from sitting around in my office playing video games all day long. Amen? I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm trying to learn everything that I can learn about my Savior. This, this stuff... It just blows me away, this Bible. Amen. I've read other books. I don't get what I get out of this Bible. So I become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus shows up on the scene. You want to tell everybody about Jesus. You may not get all the Moseses right in the right place in the Bible. And you might think that Moses put all the animals on the ark. and this. I mean, you might not get it right. But you're going to tell them about Jesus. Amen. Then God will have you slow down a little bit. He's going to teach you doctrine. He's going to teach you about things that are past, things that are present. He's going to teach you about things in the future. Amen? And then one of these days, there's going to be a revelation going on. Okay? That old beast, remember him? You know who he is, Bradley? I bet Megan's finding it out too. Amen? Okay? Well, I'll well, figure it out. Lisa's figured mine out. I got hers. Okay? I know that old beast that we're kidding, we don't like anymore. We see in the book of Revelation that, number one, God himself is going to take him and throw him into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. And everything that goes with him, and everything that defileth, and everything that lies, and everything that is impure and unclean and unrighteous in your life, Jim, one of these days, God is going to take it away from you, and it will never bother you again. And you will live in a place, listen to me, take your Bibles, 
Turn to Revelation. Chapter 20. No, 21. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. How many of you want to be there? Say amen. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he shall dwell with them and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. I'm glad this Bible's in order. I'm glad I don't have to look forward to the past. I get to look forward to the future. I asked Lindsay last night if I could add this, and she said, yeah. Adeline only lived five weeks. But you know what I saw? We were there when she began. And we had hope. We had dreams. And then the reality of struggles kicked in here. Because every day was a, it was a battle. It was a war. Five weeks old. And I guarantee you this Bible was as much the book of her life as it is mine. And we would go in and sing to her and read little children's stories to her. She got to hear all that. At one point I sat down with Antonio and I said, let me tell you what the Bible says. Though she's born and shaped in iniquity, she's safe. Because Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And our family, we tried every time people came to us, you know, how's everything? Let me tell you about Jesus. And it's the pure doctrines of the Bible that brought us to where we are today because of her and right now she has that final night Lindsay and Antonio just they, she, she said she cries a lot she's really suffering dad she wasn't able to make noises, but they could see it on her. And right now, she's not crying no more. And she's healed. And we don't owe a bill to God for fixing her. Because the bill was already paid. And no more things will offend her. And nothing shall separate her from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. And I want to go there. I want to go there and see my daddy. And I want to go there and see my little girl. And I'm going to be looking for you. You won't make it if you let life stop right here. You're headed for hell. And you will not see my grandbaby everything that God does he does not do to us he does for us it's hard 
I just soon not go through. I'd, I'll be honest with you. I don't want anybody to have to go through what we're going through right now. I do not wish this on anybody. I don't care if I hate you. I don't want you to have to go through this. But if God can take this thing. Man, I don't want to say this. If God can take something very precious out of my life. And turn it into a blessing for me or for somebody else. I'll let him do that. I want to go back to the beginning. I was studying a word one time and I fell upon the first place that this word was mentioned in the scriptures. I was studying the word taken. You know where the first place the word taken is mentioned in the scriptures? Genesis 2. God wounded Adam. The Bible says he had taken a rib from Adam. And I just, I feel like, man, I've been wounded. Oh, it hurts. It hurts so bad. I had my time yesterday of just, man, I pounded my fist. And I, I heaved. Oh, it hurts. And I've been mad, but not mad at God. I know better. I know, I know what this Bible is. I know what it says. It's the book of life. So God wounded Adam, and he took something from him. You see, that, that rib, I'll tell you what it represents. you got 12 over here and 12 over here. 12 is the number for promise. So he took that rib. And I remember back when I first heard that Sweetie Pie wanted to go out on a date with me. And I went, she's hot. See, when you're 20, they're hot. Be honest. When you're 45, they're sweet. Amen. I was in love. Okay. So think about, listen to this now. You listen to this. You're, you don't want to give up anything to live for God. So I'm going to pray that God takes it. Because we don't want to give it up. And God took a rib. Look at what he made out of that. Adam looks at this. And he's going. I would have given you my right arm and right leg. Okay? I would have given a liver for this. And he cleaved unto his wife from that moment on. And they lived. We know Adam lived 930 years. That is a long time to live with one woman. Listen, seriously. But you know what? When you cleave to your wife, it, it's, just, it's not but just a brief moment. Amen? It's not 50. 50 years is nothing. Okay? What God had taken, He brought back better than what it was before. That is the consistent theme of the Scriptures. This is why I can stand here and preach this this morning. Instead of folding up like a house of cards. I can stand here and tell you that I know that that Bible is the book of my life. In my past, my present, and my future are recorded in that. See, in thy book, all my members were written. Watch this now. Which in continuance were fashioned. From Genesis... Wow! Doodads are going up and down my back. From Genesis, to the law, to the kings, to the psalms, to the judgment, to the Savior, 
to the telling, to the doctrine, to the end. Your life is in continuance fashioned by the order that is contained in that book. I will never walk away from my future. I like to walk away from my past. But I'm walking toward the future that is contained in this book. I'd like for you to do the same thing. Don't. Don't listen to me. Don't. Don't get stuck here. Let Jesus show up and take you the rest of the way. You follow me? I'd like for you to stand to your feet. I'd like, I'd like for God to save somebody today. I don't care if He does it here, out there in internet land. I don't always get what I want. And I know God has a better way and a better plan. But I just, I'm just telling you, if you're here, right here, you want, you're, not, you're not there. God has a better way for you. But even when you're here, right now, God's teaching you things that will sustain you through all this stuff that we're going through. God will sustain you and God will give you great and precious and better promises. Okay? He will. I promise you He will. So this morning, I'm, I'm just, I tell you what, I just feel like praying this morning. That's what I'm going to do. And maybe my family would like to come down and, and just pray here. But... And if you'd like to pray with us, you're, you can. <clears throat> but I'm going, to pray that, I'm going to pray that somebody gets saved. Hello folks, Pastor Mike here. And sometimes you'll hear me talk about during a sermon or a teaching about being saved or salvation. And some people just don't know what that is. And I just want to share with you from the Bible what it means to be saved. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. I'm not here as a pastor or here as part of this church because I'm better than anybody. I'm here because I'm a sinner. I have done things that have violated the laws of God. And uh, I need to be sorry for those. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. We all have what's coming to us as a result of our sinfulness and as a result of us breaking God's law. And some people say, well, you know, it says death. Yeah, we're all going to die. But that doesn't necessarily mean hell. The Bible also says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. See, the Bible teaches, and we teach here in a literal place called hell. We believe in a literal place of uh, joy and peace and eternal life that is in heaven, that God gives to those that are saved. But we also believed in e eternal hell, a place of everlasting torment to those who reject God's gift of salvation. So we know that we have sinned. We know that the wages of that sin is death. But the Bible says in the same verse, Romans 6, 23, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, including me and including you, would believe in Him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Being saved means being born again, and being saved from the wrath of God's judgment upon us, what we deserve, what we have coming, as a result of our sinfulness. So the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I don't know about you, but one of the greatest things, in fact, the greatest thing that has ever happened to Mike Hoggard is the fact that I confessed my sins to God. And God forgave and still does forgive every one of my sins. Romans 10 says it this way. It says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What it means to be saved is that God has, has cornered you with the result 
and the things, the effects of your sin in your life. The Holy Spirit is bearing down on your soul right now. And you feel the guilt of Almighty God upon you. And God is trying to make you so that you just like our parents used to do. God used to, is trying to make you sorry for your sins. We confess those sins to God. We repent of them, which means that we don't want sin to be a part of our life any longer. And we simply ask God, God, you take over the reins in my life and you be the Lord of my life. And you give me the promise of your Holy Spirit in me so that I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven now. And I want you to understand that God offers salvation to you today if you will accept his free gift. Trust in the Lord, repent of your sins. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you watch any of our videos or at some point and God is just dealing with you, you bow your head and you call upon the name of the Lord and ask God to forgive you and ask God to save you. And God promised in His Word, and God has never broken His Word, God promised in His Word that He would forgive you and that He would save you and heaven would be your eternal home. I hope and pray that one of these days I see you in heaven and you get to see me in heaven. God bless you. Bye-bye.